Thank you to the Board of Education. Um, point of order if everybody turn off their cell phones for the evening, that'd be great. Um, if you leave them on, it interferes with the RF field also, so it's both the ringing and the, the static on the TV. And with that, they'll join me in saying Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Uh, first order of business, call the roll. Ready, President Wasserman? Here. Vice President Berenstadt will be here later. Secretary Baker here. Treasurer Singer? Here. Member Frizee? Here. Member Gorton? Absent. And Member McFarland? Here. We have a quorum. Um, moving into the consent agenda, the first item on the agenda, you'll see them listed. Uh, we have the meeting minutes from last time, five resignations. Uh, the 18 proposals for our consideration uh, were given to us at last meeting. Uh, we'll be adopting those pending the prioritized list of budgeting allows. Um, district paper purchases, the bond funds for environmental services. It's, we're going to start seeing more and more of these on our agenda as they come up. This one to the low bidder. Uh, bond fund for our middle school um, boiler and its uh, surrounding uh, architecture is in there. And approval of school payments for the month of March and also to the true law firm for in April. Any additions or deletions or comments on the consent agenda? Seeing none, I'll accept a motion. I will move to adopt the consent agenda 2.1 through 2.8 as outlined in the minute or in the agenda. Any second? I'll second that. All uh, moved by Scott, seconded by Pam. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Move on to Board of Education matters, and I'm going to turn it over to, to Mike to lead the parade a little bit. Our first presentation tonight is Seabird Elementary with their science fair, and I'm going to turn it over to the principal, Susan Johnson. Thank you. Good evening. It's my pleasure to bring you a little piece of our annual Seabird Science Fair tonight. I'm going to introduce Kim Scott, who is our PTO Voluntary Science Fair chairperson. And we have some students with you tonight to share what they've done, what they've learned, and their excitement about science. And, and Susan, before she begins, um, just fair warnings to the students. When you get done, leave your posters up for a couple minutes. We'd like to come out and look at them and ask you a few questions. Hello. Um, this is very exciting to be here. The science fair is really actually my passion. I'm a parent at Seabrook, but I'm also a science educator. So it's just been wonderful how great the PTO has been. They are really supportive of the science fair, and the teachers have been very supportive along with the parents. And the fair actually started six years ago, and it was Tracy Green who had started it. And then when I moved here and found out there was a fair, I said, can I help you? And then her kids moved on to Jefferson, and then I took over as chair. And then we now have a nice committee that helps out with all the different things. And then I try to leave myself available for the kids to help them with their projects. And then any questions they have, and then I help recruit the judges, and they help with everything else. So for the fair, we have some goals of our fair is to create a memorable, positive science experience for the kids. And we also like to teach, make sure we teach the students the scientific method and the correct way to do an investigation. Because if we do the fair and not teach that, there's really no point to it. So we really make sure that they have the tools ahead of time to do it correctly. And then we also want to make it a positive experience for families. Because when they come home and say they want to do the science fair, the parents panic. And there's some that say no. And it's just what's going to happen. So we really try to make sure the parents have the resources to be able to help the kids. So two months before, I go into all the classrooms and I do a demonstration. And the main goal of the demonstration is really get them excited about science. And if you can get them to bring that demonstration home and talk about it at the dinner table, then you've really accomplished something. So I try to come in and do it and show them about the science fair, get them to come home and say I'm interested in it. And then at that point, we offer a workshop. So they can decide if they want to sign up at the workshop. And that's to help the parents know if they want to sign up to do the workshop. So we do two workshops. And um, one is for the kindergarten, second grade. And then we do another hour for the third through fifth grade. And that way, we do an investigation at the workshop. We show them how to do it, get the parents familiar with what the expectations are, because it's very different from a kindergarten to a fifth grade. Expectations are very 
different. So we do an experiment, and then I show them the four question strategy, which can take anything they want, a toy they have at home, something they're interested in, and they answer these four questions, and they come up with their own original project, because they could very well pick something online, pretty much just copy it and do it on their board. We would want them to come up with something original. So we get projects, you'll even see here with theirs, that range from baking cookies to doing chemistry experiments. We've had kids go out sledding with their family and do experiments with the sleds where one's on the sled, then it's the boy, then it's his dad, then it's the two of them on the sled, and they measure the distance. So they get a lot of creativity just from following the strategy to come up with their own, with their own individual projects. And the workshop has greatly increased the participation in the fair because it's helped the parents to come and say, okay, we can do this. So I've had kindergarten first graders and their parents come in and they go, I have no idea about the science fair. And then they come to the workshop and they go, okay, now I can help them. And then when the parents come that night, they're so excited. And I had a parent one time who did a kindergarten project and she didn't know what to do. And she's like, my child wants to do the cat, our cat. I don't know what to do about the cat. I said, we'll come up with something. <laughs> and, and sure enough, her daughter came up to test cat toys. And she tested different cat toys and then she rolled up aluminum foil. And the cat liked the aluminum foil the best. She timed like how long the cat played with everything. And so that mom came to the fair and the daughter and they were so excited and they've done the fair ever since. So it's been a really nice experience. We've gone up from having the fair. It started for third, fourth, and fifth grade. And then three years ago, we opened it up to everybody. And last year, we had 80 kids. We had boys and girls. We have boys here tonight showing their projects, but there are girls that do it too. And this past year, we had 60 kids participate. So it's been quite a, quite a feat in trying to get the judging arranged at night. It can be very, very difficult. We also do... To help the kids, we have online a workbook series that we use for creating original investigations. And so I have that available for all of them so they can go online and they can download it. And it will take them through the beginning all the way through the process. And it has kindergarten, first grade is one workbook, second and third, and fourth and fifth. So every two years, the expectations go up. So like a kindergarten, first grade project might do an experiment of with or without salt, hot and cold, and compare just two things. And then, uh, second and third grader doesn't just compare two, they're now doing cold water, warm water, and hot water. And then they might do one trial, or maybe two. And then when they get to fourth and fifth grade, it's pretty much the parents take a step back a little more, and they're now doing three changes, but they're also doing three or more trials. So it builds on each other, so there's different judging forms for all the grade levels. And I think that helps keep the kids interested too, because it builds, and it also makes it fun for the kids, because for a kindergartner, they can sometimes get their experiment done in a half an hour. It doesn't take that long, and then it's a matter of the board together. So the workbook <coughs> series has really helped, and we've noticed that the projects have really increased in quality. The judges all say they have a hard time with the judging forms because they have to score the kids all so high because the projects look so well. So they've told me I have to add extra <laughs> points to it. And so we have a lot of wonderful judges. It usually takes about 15 to 20 judges, and we do it in two hours in one night. Usually it's two and a half hours. It takes the judges a long time. And they get judged two times. So the judges visit their projects two times. And um, they score them. It's really fun night. The judges, I think, sometimes have more fun than the kids. But the kids all tell me that their favorite part a lot of times is talking to the judges. They're so proud when they stand in front of their boards. And they will talk and talk to anybody that comes up. So it's really, it's really a neat evening. And so we're lucky in this town, it's not too hard to find people with a science background to get <laughs> judges. So that has, that has really helped us a lot. And then we give ribbons for first, second, and third place. And then all the kids get a certificate. And then we also, because sometimes they're being judged, but sometimes they're waiting for awards. So we had Engineering for Kids, which is a new local business. It's a franchise that just started in the area. They came this year and they provided activities and then Camp Invention that does a program. I know they do one at Adams. They also come, and then we had the School Lego League come, and then in the past we've had the Science Resource Center come. So they provide activities. We take up the whole school when we do the fair. So the kids can go down there and do stuff. They can walk around and see the projects, and then they also have the judging. So it's been really wonderful, a lot of great support, and the kids have done very fabulous projects. So we have today, I have, uh, fifth grade project, a fourth grade project, 
in uh, third grade and a second grade. So we have Tyler Garza in fifth grade, Ben Scott in fourth grade, and then Micah Dan in third grade and Sam Scott in second grade. So when you look at them, you can kind of see there might be some differences. Our first grader couldn't come tonight, so you don't get to see that comparison. But, but these are some so you can see how it builds upon each other, and it's a great, great STEM, and it also goes well with the next generation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, what I'd like to do, board members, uh, if you'll turn off your mics, because I've been told it'll screw up the feed, uh, just turn off your mics. We'd like to wander up and look at the posters for just a couple minutes, and then we may have a couple questions for you.
your mics back on <laughs> well thanks guys first of all and I guess we open it up to any questions for either you or the students so open up to the board for any questions or comments no just fabulous thank you guys very much for coming tonight an amazing job <clears throat> it was it was neat I learned something about uh, if I put put nails in concrete it'll make it stronger but if I put something that has uh, a little more uh, rectangle uh, edges and s when you add them it's a lot stronger you said the concrete just sticks right to it so that was neat maybe uh, we can learn from that when we put in our uh, new parking lot <laughs> <laughs> Well, the one I liked was was the young man who had a hypothesis proven wrong, where he thought the thickness of the socks was going to make the difference, and the thickness is irrelevant, and it was the material, and he figured that out. So it was very good. Not every hypothesis is going to be true. Most hypotheses are not going to be true. So very good. Any other questions? Thank you Thank for you. doing this. This is wonderful. <laughs> I'm going to hand it to Mike uh, for a very special <coughs> award this evening to a very special person to the community of Midland and Midland Public Schools. We had the opportunity to nominate somebody for um, what's called Champions for Children, and it's somebody who's gone above and beyond for children. And the first name that we came up to mind was Dr. Bruce Zelensky. And uh, I think we'd like to come up. I want to read a bunch of good things about him. <laughs> And um, I, I think it's best to, to actually read the nomination that several people who've known him for years, unlike myself, who've been so impressed with, with him for two years, um, had to say about that. And so look, bear with me as I read through this. Dr. Dolinsky is truly a champion for children in our community. He's considered by most people as Mr. Education in Midland. It, it is easy to see why. Dick served for almost 18 years over two different time periods on the Midland Public Schools Board of Education. During his tenure, several Curricular advancements were made in our schools. Middle Public Schools is a legacy of excellence and integrity, much of the last 20 to 30 years due to Dick's leadership. He drove constantly to ensure our system addressed the needs of all children from the brightest, the most educationally and economically challenged. He is responsible for recruiting and mentoring several of today's board members, including Mr. Wasserman. <laughs> Even between stints on the boards, after he retired, veteran board members and superintendents sought his counsel and advice on challenging and critical issues facing the district and community. He'll be at millage campaigns, superintendent searches, or school closures. A 20 years board member and another former board president, Rick Oley, referred to Dick Kowalski as a leader's leader, a trusted confidant, a leader that had a special combination of passion, intellectual insight, analytical thought, and people sensitivity. He was able to, to delicately and effectively balance the financial realities with the education priorities data, perspective, the people impact, all with fairness, compassion, and resolve. Respect to professionalism, dedication, and commitment were the hallmarks of his time on the Board of Education. The many board members he served who classified Dick as a Hall of Fame Board of Education member in all ways. After retiring from the board, Dick took his talents and interest into educating young people to another plateau. He established the Legacy Center for Community Success a nonprofit organization focused on mitigating outside the classroom ba ba barriers to learning and development. In the first several years, this resulted in vision tests and corrective actions for preschool children in our city to eliminate vision issues as an impediment to early learning. In 2004, Dick introduced the concept of developmental assets to the Midland community. The developmental assets framework identified a set of skills, experiences, relationships, and behaviors that are 
that enable young people to develop successful contributing adults. Fixed effort eventually led to the development of the Midden County Youth Master Plan, which continues to serve as a guidepost for local youth serving organizations. I am proud to build upon the foundation that Dick has built when it comes to the well being of youth in our community, says Jennifer Hieronymo, President and CEO of the Legacy Center. We are 10 years into this effort and the momentum continues to build, all thanks to Dick. Let's you think Dick's influence is only in Midland, it's now winding down. Dick again. As a Rotarian, Dick has led our local and regional rotary in eradicating diseases throughout the world, particularly polio. He has personally visited Africa to monitor the effectiveness of programs set up by the Rotary and Gates Foundation. His last trip was to observe inoculation of children just before the, ter before the terrible terrorist activities began in West Africa. In 2013, Dick funded and co-chaired the committee to support 21st century learning a group that assists Midland Public Schools in elections and other full of parent endeavors. This group was inst instrumental in the recent passage of the Midland Public Schools bond proposal on February 4, 24. As an advocate for educating kids, all kids effectively, Dick Dolinsky has left big shoes to fill. I can only hope as one of his successors at Midland Public Schools that someday someone feels I have filled even one of those shoes to the degree Dick has done over the decades of driving to educate all children in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Dick. And I think the uh, board members want to say a few things as well. And I think then we'll turn it over to you. I guess I'll lead since I authored the letter. Uh, you truly were a mentor. I, I don't know if that's good or bad. You got me into this. Uh, so thank you, or maybe not thank you. Uh, but Dick, when, when Mike came to me, Mike came to me saying, who, he didn't come to me saying, who do you think would be a good candidate from Midland to even suggest to do this uh, to the Minim Minimum Association of School Administrators. He came to me and said, Dick Delinsky is an obvious choice for this. What do you think? <laughs> and uh, that it, it was very clear that was true. And for all those in the audience and on the TV audience in particular, you won't see people who are here tonight. Uh, Dick is responsible for more than 30 years of uh, Midland Public Schools past. He was responsible in hiring Dr. Art Frock back in 1985, and that was 30 years ago. He uh, hired another superintendent, Gary Hughes. Both were here this evening, and uh, several board members were here, and even more, Gloria Schonemeyer was here, who was his boss for all those years. <laughs> um, so Dick, you've served yeoman service for Midland Public Schools and the children of the Midland community, and I can't say thank you enough. Oh, it's not attached. Be careful. Yeah. <laughs> Coming behind all those wonderful secret students is a tough, <laughs> tough act to follow. <laughs> those dropping the microphone. My children went to secret school, so it's nice to see that that tradition continues. Did Susan leave already? I don't think so. So thank you for that. <clears throat> it's uh, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. I want to thank uh, Cindy and everybody who made the arrangements for the wonderful reception that we had just prior to the school board meeting. It was a, a very touching thing to see four former superintendents here, uh, a whole bunch of former school board members, community members. Um, it, it was very touching. I appreciate that. <clears throat> this is a tremendous honor for me, and I want you all to know that I am most grateful for and deeply humbled by this recognition. However, it's very awkward for me to be accepting this award for two reasons, two important reasons. The first is that my sainted mother always said that we should do our good works uh, in private and not for recognition. Her favorite expression with her tongue firmly in cheek was that we all should be good for nothing. So I think I qualify. <clears throat> the second reason is that while you pay tribute to me, in a much larger sense, this award more truly belongs to all the many women and men who tirelessly toil daily to educate and develop children, as we saw earlier today. The true credit and, res and respect more properly goes to them, the countless parents, <coughs> families, volunteers, school board members, yes, school board members, teachers, administrators, social services providers, law enforcement, judges, child serving agencies, funders, faith based organizations. I think you see what, what I'm trying to say that there are many, many others who serve our children who are very deserving of this award. It wasn't too long ago that I sat at the same table at which you're seated today. And I came to realize during those years that in addition to school, youth learning and development requires appropriate attention to a child's environment. 
At the Legacy Center, we collaborated with many youth-serving agencies to develop, as Mr. Sharrow said, the Youth Master Plan. What we discovered is that there are four key elements that each need to be adequately addressed in order for a child to flourish and thrive. They are in no particular order, physical health, social, emotional, and spiritual health, basic needs and safety, and education. Fortunately for many children, their families provide these essential elements for success. Unfortunately for many others, these conditions are not in place, causing the child's learning and development to be severely limited. Where some of these elements are lacking, the child is often absent from school, begins to fall behind, may get into behavioral difficulties, and in many cases, ultimately leaves school without graduating. The data indicate that nearly half of Michigan's prisoners have neither a GED or a high school diploma. Over 70% read at less than a third grade level. Research also indicates that the two biggest drivers of these problems are poverty and living in a single parent family. Charles Dickens provides us with a powerful illustration of this issue in his famous novel, A Christmas Carol. In a dialogue between Scrooge and the ghost of Christmas present, regarding a boy and a girl hidden beneath the ghost's cloak, Scrooge asks, spirit, are they yours? They are man's, said the spirit. This boy is ignorance, this girl is want. Beware them both, but most of all, beware this boy, for on his brow I see that written which is doom, unless the writings be erased. So way back when, Dickens realized that ignorance and want foreshadow doom. The question then becomes, how can we erase the writings of ignorance and want? I propose that we all seek to first understand, and then secondly, implement a community-wide concerted effort of the key elements of the Youth Master Plan. Fortunately, there are several efforts already underway that are successfully addressing each of those elements. But I'd like to highlight just a few. Research indicates that about 85% of the brain's so-called hard wiring for cognitive learning is developed in the first five or six years of life. This brain development is facilitated by cognitive stimulation through high quality preschools, reading books, solving puzzles, and the like. Unfortunately, the most disadvantaged children often do not have access to these resources. Programs such as the Imagination Library and Preschool Tool Totes encourage this cognitive development by providing learning supplies to our preschoolers and by engaging their parents. Even more exciting, Efforts are currently underway to assure that every child has the opportunity to attend a high quality preschool beginning at age three, irrespective of family income. Next, the community has rallied admirably behind the concept of developmental assets, as Mr. Shero noted. Midland County Probate Judge Doreen Allen, who was here earlier this evening, in particular has applied this concept in evidence-based programs and in collaboration with multiple youth-serving agencies such as the Community Center, The Rock, and others, to dramatically reduce delinquency, recidivism rates, and to realize a striking reduction in the percentage of offenders' siblings coming into the court system. In addition, the court cumulatively saved over $4.2 million, and more importantly, significantly improved the quality of life and the probability of success for countless numbers of our youth. And lastly, in an attempt to close the various gaps identified in the Youth Master Plan, a collaborative effort of the schools, social agencies, and various other community resources has come together to implement what's called the Community Schools Model. The schools identify children who are chronically absent and or have behavioral issues and refer them to a Department of Human Services youth specialist who then determines their needs. Community resources are secured to address these needs that are closely aligned with the Youth Master Plan such as, and not limited to, counseling, dental work, uh, food, clothing, uh, additional tutoring, and the like. The results of a couple of pilots with this program at schools with high poverty levels have been stunning. At one school, in the face of an increase in poverty level from 68 to 73 percent of the students, attendance increased to community averages, including one day with 100 percent attendance, and it wasn't count day. And more impressively, scores on standardized tests, state tests increased by over 30% at this school. The community schools approach has grown and currently is operating in five county schools. These are just a few impressive examples of what a community can achieve when we have a plan, the Youth Master Plan, collaborate to work in concert and devote our time, talent, and treasure to successfully implement it. 
I believe we need to step up as a society and better support these kinds of efforts that promote learning and development. In the overall continuum of financial support, fund dollars more likely and rightfully tend to flow into alleviating immediate and dire human needs, such as for food, clothing, and shelter. And while addressing these immediate needs is very appropriate, I think we need to reconsider increasing investments in the planning and prevention end of the continuum as well, into programs that foster learning and development. It's as old as the story of giving a fish or teaching to fish. We need to invest more of our dollars into teaching to fish, if only to erase those writings that Dickens foresaw and to forestall doom. We have a deep yearning, all of us do, to improve the world, especially for the disadvantaged or the unlucky. We all want a world that works for everyone. To me, education, along with a strong support system, is the most important mechanism to accomplish this dream. It's the way to unlock the door to the future, to move from darkness to light, and as Nelson Mandela once said so profoundly, education is the most powerful weapon we have to change the world for the better. We all know what to do, but knowing isn't enough. We actually have to do it. The rest is merely persistence or tenacity. So let us decide to act, to increase our investments in learning and youth development, to use our existing time and talents wisely and collaboratively to get it right for our children. It won't take a miracle, just our will to act. So once again, my deepest appreciation to all involved for this recognition and my warmest, best personal wishes for all those, including all of you at that table, who are teaching and developing our children that your work and theirs bear an abundance of fruit. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> yes, you can't. You don't break it. I think uh, Dick's eloquent words uh, make it obvious why he was chosen. Thank you, Dick. Hand over mic. <laughs> our shining stars for this month, and our first uh, recipient is Helen Gibbons. And Helen, come on. Let me read a little bit about Helen. Ms. Gibbons began her MPS career as a first grade teacher at Adams Elementary in 1997. Helen's entire MPS career has been spent educating Adams Elementary first grade students. Ms. Gibbons earned her Bachelor of Science degree from Ohio State University in 1995 with a major in elementary education. In 2002, she earned her Master's of Arts degree in elementary teaching from Saginaw Valley State University. Some comments by Helen's supervisors have included, Ms. Gibbons is a motivated educator. It is evident that she truly enjoys her profession and seeks ways, seeks ways to bring this joy and learn her students' experiences. It has truly been a pleasure to work with Ms. Gibbons. She's a valued member of the Adams team. Mrs. Gibbons treats her students with an equal amount of care and respect. Students enjoy coming to school and are excited to learn every day. Mrs. Gibbons is an important part of Adams and the Adams family. She challenges her students to do their best academically, socially, and behaviorally. She is, she is one who views teaching as a lifelong journey, learning and growing with her students. Helen was nominated for the Shining Star Award by an MPS colleague who is also a parent. Here are some of her comments. Helen is a great teacher. I attended a presentation of the children around the world produced in her classroom. Helen worked weekends taping and compiling a video for the presentation. She, she also then made copies so parents could have a keepsake. She has taught more than one of my children and I'm always impressed with how she adapts to each children's learning disability. Congratulations, Helen. He is a pleasure to have East Lawn and is willing to help in any way he can. The 
Mr. Seamster is very considerate, polite, and friendly to all the encounters. Mr. Seamster is truly a leader within our building. He is trustworthy, dependable, and he uses great judgment. He thoroughly cares and shows his passion for his work with children day in and day out. Brett was nominated for the Shining Star Award by a member of the MPS colleagues. Some of their comments include that Brett is truly one of those employees who are irreplaceable, the kind who would not be able to carry on the same if they were gone. Brett is truly a team player and does his job with a smile, no matter how big the task. Brett has a very positive attitude and a great role model for our youth. His relationship with staff and students proves he is a kind, hardworking individual who enjoys his job and loves working with students. Brett is an exception, exceptional staff member at East Lawn. Brett is always willing to assist with any student need, behavioral or academic, and does so in a calm, reassuring, and caring manner. He often goes out of his way to ensure students are successful and feel cared for. Brett is a fundamental part of our staff and is a highlight in many of our students' days. Congratulations, Brett. is going to be our NPS logo, new logo. As you know, we've been working on this for a while, and we've had some help in, um, from our students at the high school and Carol Lewin. <coughs> and we had a number of logos, if you recall, we, we had some public voting, and we had uh, board voting on that, and we've narrowed them down, and um, we had a, a couple Surprises where some of our logos had to be tweaked and changed a little because we were a little bit too much like some others in town. Oh. And if Cindy can get this up, I'll stop talking. And we'll <laughs> <laughs> can we turn the light off by any chance? Can you read that? So this has been two years in the making, as I said. We've been working with the uh, art class at, at DH, uh, DHS. And, um, Obviously, our goal is over time to replace the old logo with the new, so we're not going to put a bunch of money in and change every school building and every logo, but over time, we'll change our, our website logo and business cards throughout the district. And so we need to go to the next slide. There she is. All right, I could have stood up and done that. No, it's right there. there. Hit the key. See if that does it. There, there we go. We go. Oh. And so we're going to use a little bit of a, a two of logos because our understanding, uh, probably from Carol, that it may not screen perfectly on all materials, and so you'll see the uh, triangle slightly change in its color depending on the use of that. Uh, we really, this was the the logo that are the um, inspiring excellence. This piece that everyone fell in love with. Our designer, our student designer, was Brandy Wheeler, and Brandy's here tonight. Is that right, Carol? Yeah. As well as Where Carol's in the pet in the back as well. So we really want to say thank you, Brandy, and Carol, and Brandy. If you want to stand up and come up where we can see you, since you're the <laughs> designer of this. <laughs> you want to come up, Carol? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Nice work. Nice job. And obviously this, one, uh, this was our selection, but if you recall, we had um, four or five of them here, the finalists, and they were all excellent and they great were. students. And Carol does such a great job with them. I don't know if you want to say anything, feel free if you do. Or. Uh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, first of all, I think I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to do something like this. Uh, it's an incredible uh, achievement to have something like this, especially for such a large district. So I'd like to thank you for that. Um, it was a lot of hard work, but I hope you're happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it's tough to pick a logo, as you guys well know, and we have all we we did our best to give you every possible nook and cranny and um, one of the things that we'd like to do for you now that one is designed and chosen we'd like to set up a graphical standard so that it's 100 percent right every time mm -hmm. so we'll develop that here in the final hour so that you have that and if anybody wants to produce anything on letterhead or shirts or whatever you can match colors and 
keep things a certain standard so we're not getting things that are piratized or changed in any way. So sure, while you're out there, you know, sure. this is this logo design isn't just one the first one they've done. They they do this for many many. We do. We we one of the things that we have at Dow High we're lucky to have is um, and have had for years and years and years is we call it commercial art with print technology and essentially we partner with a lot of the um, printing firms in town, um, McKay Press and um, we, we, we kind of morphed out commercial graphic printing and when the digital era came on board and so we partner with a lot of large industry and that we teach students the desktop publishing um, on industry standard software and then we let industry, my great friend Jim Nigro, those of you that might know him through the Rotary, he's a Rotarian, he's a great guy, mm -hmm. great friend. And he finishes off, he rounds out the um, commercial graphic printing side and digital side. So we kind of partner with a lot of industries and we've designed brochures and billboards and um, you name it. We've worked for Dow Chemical and Shelter House and we just about every brand in this town and, and, and design has been done by a student. It's a real win-win because we don't expect any money but we have pro bono work that we can practice on and, and people get a lot of creative things that maybe need a little more sprucing up at the end but get a lot more ideas and not paying for it. As you guys well know, you enlisted the help <laughs> of a service provider and got one design and now you get, you know, 22, 23, 27, whatever and you can go from there. So it's a real win-win on both sides. And we have the, some of the best kids anyways. I really believe that. And uh, Brandy's done a great job. She's been a pleasure to work with. We felt, the great Cindy Young and I felt, that um, the top design is, um, although diamond-like, which is kind of nice, we thought it might be complex for things like embroidery. So we went back to the middle and public kind of morph. And really, if you look at any commercial brand slash logo, you'll find that things evolve. No one likes a brand new design. You see that in automotive design all the time. And um, this class has spawned more scholarships and designers. We just had one that, uh, I, I could be up here and brag about my kids. You wouldn't want me to do that. But recently, a young lady just got a job in, uh, designing for the Atlantic Magazine, um, Kara Gordon, class of 2009. I mean, we hear this kind of stuff all the time. So very successful. Great kids. And thank you for the opportunity. It's very much time. <laughs> Brandy, uh, could you just very briefly, uh, for the benefit of the folks in the audience and myself as well, uh, remind us of the inspiration for your design? All right. So uh, I started with, uh, obviously the envelope and I just after seeing that for so long in so many of the hallways it, <laughs> the colors were like they were just really awful to look at so I tried to do <laughs> <laughs> don't get me wrong I like the old logo <laughs> but <laughs> the colors were just really bland and you'd see them all the time and they didn't really encompass like all of the schools it was more centered towards the green that we have so I tried to do more of like a, the rainbow-ish to uh, encompass all of the schools that we have, because they all have different colors and whatnot. So it'd be cool if the district logo could contain all of the colors. So then what I did is I took the uh, triangles of the, like the black triangles on the sides, and I had uh, moved them to uh, face a different direction. And then so rather than like a totally new logo, it's just moving forward with the same logo and changing it to for the new generation rather than being an, <laughs> an envelope. Which yeah. you loved. Huh? The envelope which you loved. <laughs> loved it so much. <laughs> so excited to work on that. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, Brandy. Thank, Thank you, Carol. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to Board of Education matters, and the first item is ratification of the resolution regarding the 2015 bond issue. We have uh, Mr. Armarino from Truman Law Firm. He's our bond counsel, and um, he's going to talk about that ratification resolution for our 2015 bond issue that we'll take action on tonight. Good evening. Christopher I. Marino again from Truen Law Firm. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, what we're asking the board to consider is what we call a ratification resolution. Purpose of the ratification resolution is effectively to close the loop. Back uh, a couple months ago, your board approved an authorizing resolution, authorizing the administration to move forward with the pricing and to accept the pricing of, of your bonds. And, and the purpose of this resolution is then to have the board ratify and affirm that pricing, uh, and we s are scheduled to close in the near future. So what I'd like to do is go through the resolution with you 
explain to you what we're asking you to consider this evening. And I invite questions either as I'm discussing it or if you want to save them until the end, that's fine also. So we start with uh, the first page of the resolution in the whereas section. It basically tells us how we got to where we are today. It references that March 16 authorizing resolution that authorized up to $72,640,000 worth of bonds. It also identifies that Stiefel Nicholas and company was designated as your, uh, as your underwriter and authorized the administration to accept the, uh, the bid of Stiefel Nicholas, provided it fit within the parameters that were set by that March resolution. Then we roll into the operative paragraphs of the resolution. Paragraph one basically goes through in detail the pricing on the issue. The bonds will actually be issued in an amount of $64,110,000 and will be designated the 2015 School Building and Site Bonds Series 1. The Series 1 designation indicates that not all of the authority that was granted by the, the voters of your district has been used in this series, but instead there will be uh, at least one additional uh, issuance out of that authorization in the future. <clears throat> um, the, uh, the district still has uh, slightly more than $48,760,000 worth of capacity left on that authorization. Paragraph 2 identifies that the bonds will be dated March 21, so later this week on Thursday, uh, and it identifies the, the coupon dates 2016 through 32. There's a term bond in there in 2034, and then a final maturity in 35. Interest will begin being paid on November 1 of 2015. And there is a schedule that's attached to the resolution uh, as uh, Exhibit A that basically breaks down that, uh, that maturity schedule. If we turn the page to page two, paragraph three identifies the opportunity to redeem the bonds prior to maturity. Bonds payable May 1, 2026 and thereafter are payable prior to maturity uh, on any date after May 1, 2025. It allows the district to uh, pay off bonds early in the event that the market rates uh, allow a cheaper, uh, a cheaper replacement rate than the rates that you have currently. Something akin to uh, a, a refinancing of a home mortgage. Details are different, but the concept is roughly the same. Paragraph four identifies that term bond. Paragraph five sets forth the procedures for notification if bonds are redeemed prior to maturity. Paragraph 6 identifies how bonds would be replaced if there's a sale or a transaction in the future on the bonds. Paragraph 7 identifies the uh, structure issues related to the principal and interest and the, uh, the denomination of the bonds. Paragraph 8 identifies how the bond monies will be used on May 1, uh, I'm sorry, May 21, uh, 2015. Uh, the costs of issuance are identified there as well as the amount that's going to be deposited into your capital projects fund. Paragraph 10 authorizes the superintendent to deliver what's called the final official statement. It's a bond prospectus that gives detail not only about your district and these bonds, but also the economic status and the fiscal status of your community. This document was used in the pricing of the bonds and it was put together with a lot of effort uh, by your administration so that uh, the markets could have a fair and, and clear understanding of what your community is all about. Uh, the uh, paragraph 11 on the top of page 4 uh, identifies that the district will be designating the Huntington National Bank as its paying agent. The purpose of the paying agent is to facilitate the transfer of funds when bonds are being paid off uh, annually over the life of the issue. That's the resolution that we present this evening, asking for your, your board to vote on that. We do ask that if the board takes this issue up, that we do ask that the uh, board vote by roll call vote to uh, be perfectly clear that we have either a majority or not on the resolution. Any questions that I might be able to answer this evening for you? Nope. Pretty clear. With that, I'll accept a motion. I move we accept item 3.1, the ratification resolution on the 2015 bond issue. Second. Moved by Angela, second by Pam. Any other questions or comments? I'll make a quick comment. We're about to take Middle Public Schools into debt for the first time since 1968. And strangely enough, being a debt averse person, it actually feels good because we're going to revitalize the physical structure of our district and make it make that uh, good for the next generation of kids, like the, like the Dick Delinsky's the world made for all of us. So thank you. With that, we'll move into a roll call vote. Okay. President Wasserman? Yes. 
Vice President Brandstad? Yes. Secretary Baker? Yes. Treasurer Singer? Yes. Member Frizee? Yes. Member Gordon is absent. And Member McFarland? Yes. So we have a 6 0 vote. Motion Paris. Thank you, Crystal. Thank, Thank you. Very you. Much. Thanks for coming up. Certainly, my pleasure. ESA budget. A little different format this year. Um, we, if you remember in the past, they would come and kind of mm -hmm. present the night of. We wanted you to have that information prior, and we wanted to make sure we had an opportunity to review that. So as a county, we decided that um, uh, we would send our business directors um, over to the ESA, and they would spend a day with Mark Royal, their finance director, and John Searles, the superintendent, to go through that budget and look at some of those things. Um, and so we have done so. We presented to the FFO committee, the subcommittee of the board, and now we're ready to uh, uh, ratify their their, their uh, budget as we go forward. It's a formality. Um, they, they, it's just really a confidence vote. They can do what they need to do, and they're in anyway. Um, we know that um, that there were several issues that we were hoping that they would make uh, improvements on. We had some special ed cost surprises in the past and some increasing costs, and they've made a number of them where we feel comfortable at that time. I don't know if you want to comment on any of that, Mr. Cooper, who was, who's been directly involved with that as we go forward. It'd be just shared with the uh, uh, FFO committee, uh, the budget underlying assumptions that they had for their budget presentation. Um, like the county individual school districts, uh, they've encountered the same kind of fiscal uh, problems like everybody else, and they have uh, showed no increase in their state aid in their budget, uh, the typical increase in health insurance, and then uh, they've tried it, uh, in various ways for some budget reductions um, throughout their budget. So um, we think that all those things are, are moving in the right direction and that the budget assumptions behind their budget all, all make sense and are uh, reflective of the current financial condition across the so we feel pretty comfortable recommending that you approve their budget at this point in time. So. And their budget where it stands today reflects what we did in our budget workshop? The, the cost pull-throughs, any big changes in terms of what their numbers will be? Um, if you talk about when, when I was presenting the workshop and showing you the big picture, I would say those amounts are more likely down from, from that. So that okay. when, we, when we talked about it, and I can't recall off the top of my head, but um, I think uh, we're seeing costs that I think will come through to us that are very similar to uh, the cost of incurred this year. Okay. Not that there's not a little bit of increase, but not uh, the size we thought. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll accept the motion. I move we um, approve the Midland County ESA 2015-16 budget. Move support. by Angela, support by Lynn. Any other questions or comments? I guess I would just add it's encouraging to see progress as being made um, in this budget. Yes, been a bit of an uncertainty the last few years. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Carry the message forward. Yep. Um, the next item is our Neola spring policy update. And so Neola, the service that we uh, uh, come to, does that twice a year. And um, they come in and they do any legislative change updates mainly. Uh, the way things have been going out at the federal and state level, lots of policy changes as we go forward. And so they've made several changes in there. But any time, if you recall, we adopted that full manual, we see any tweaks or needs that we have to match our actual practices of our district, we make those as well as long as they're within the, the legal parameters of those policies. And so you've, you've had those policies and um, there's several of them there that we're asking you to approve an update to. <coughs> Uh, accept a motion first, and we can ask some questions. I motion to approve item 3.3 .3 of the NEOLA policies. Support. Moved by Pam, support by Angela. Any questions of Mike on that list? <coughs> Seeing none, moving to vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. At this point, we'll move into folks to address the board, and I know there are some people here, who, some of whom I know very well. But Mike, before I invite them up, uh, I know they're very interested in one subject. Would you like to address that subject? And, I, I, and I do. Um, um, as you know, uh, I caught a little bit of a headline in the paper there about our building trades program. And I think sometimes um, the information gets out the wrong way. And 
it, it, it appeared that the district was looking to cut a program and it was just the opposite of that. We were very supportive of the CTE program so want them to grow. Um, we did have a number issue um, with a number of students enrolled in the program and it was um, fiscally responsible for us to run at that time. Um, as of an email that I received earlier this morning, and I actually think it came late last night from, from our instructor Kevin, um, that it looks like they have recruited a number of new students. And so as of this morning, I asked the high school to confirm the um, commitment of those students. And we have, it looks like we have enough students to commit that's 20 plus anyway, uh, is what we would say. Uh, and so we are in the numbers where we can to make the adjustment, a little bit of adjustment in staffing because we have to put it back into place. We, we do staffing early enough this district this size it has some trickle down effect and so it is back in place as we go forward and um, with that some of the news that, that broke um, out there we had several um, associations and builders contact us um, in regards to the building trades program and um, we're looking to partner with them on the awareness of our CTE programs because obviously either the students or the parents or the, maybe the combination of both aren't seeing um, the quality of the program or the, that there's job potential there, um, the most pieces of our CTE programs. And so um, I'm going to ask that our curriculum division um, set up a meeting with several of those organizations. Maybe we look at a CTE awareness night in, in the high schools in either in the fall or, or probably ideally more around that um, January, summer January when we're doing student schedules would be an ideal time to begin to people's students interest in that. But again, I just do stand by that probably we need to add, go all the way back to our STEM idea of our STEM elementary school and we need to get kids thinking early on um, and knowing that there's some of these uh, other fields out there that have uh, employment needs right now and um, some good livable wages out there to be made. So, and I believe that's kind of what the group would like to talk to about tonight. So. Okay. Right. Who care to come forward? Sure, yeah. we have all sure. three of you down, so. Perfect. I'm loud, so I don't know. Uh, you have to go to the mic because the TV won't pick you up. TV camera and. Perfect. Not loud enough for tape, but loud enough for live, apparently. First, let me thank you. I mean, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, my name is Dawn Crandall, and I so appreciate the opportunity to speak to you tonight on the um, issue of career and technical education. I'm here on behalf of the Home Builders Association of Michigan. Um, at this time, I'd like to give an overview of the residential building industry, the importance of skilled trades, what the HBA of Michigan is doing to build an awareness campaign. So when I was hired in 1996 at the Home Builders, the HBA of Michigan had 36 local Home Builders associations and close to 12,000 members across the state. Our membership is comprised of builders and associate members. Our builders are licensed and insured and our associate members are comprised of bankers, insurance, refers ciders, anything that ties into the industry. Today, we have 26 local associations and close to 4,500 members around the state. We basically lost a generation of workers when the industry went into what I call the lost decade. In 2011, the HBA of Michigan Legislative Committee set an agenda that would focus on Michigan's economy and not necessarily the housing industry. It was our belief then, as it is now, that a strong economy would create a strong housing industry. So we were heavily involved in issues that impacted businesses in the areas of taxation, unemployment insurance, and business regulations. Our legislative committee met earlier this year to determine what our focus would be for the 2015-2016 legislative session. And prior to that meeting, we surveyed our members uh, to see what their issues were and what was important to them. And oddly enough, what we found was not a surprise. Uh, many of our members have been involved in the building industry for more than 20 years. In terms of employment, 12% reported having no employees, 57% reported having between 1 and 10 employees, 12% reported having between 11 and 25 employees, and 18% reported having more than 25 employees. We asked our members about Michigan's economy. 33% of our members believe Michigan's economy is actually getting better, and we're, we're excited to hear that. 59% believe it's getting a bit better, 7% believe it is neither bitter, better nor worse, and none believe it's getting worse. When we asked them how they think Michigan's residential construction industry is doing, we found that 36% believe it's doing better, 56% believe it's doing a bit better, 
4% believe it is doing neither better or worse, and almost 2% believe it's doing worse. And now for the reason I'm here before you today. We asked our members to select three, but no more than six issues that caused, him, caused them great concern. And it was no surprise to us to see workforce shortage at the top of the list. And now I'd like to focus my remaining time on the workforce shortage issue. Last session, we were fortunate to work with the Governor's Administration, Associated Builders and Contractors, the Michigan Manufacturers Association, and Farm Bureau on amending Michigan's merit curriculum. And this would allow flexibility in a high school student's day to allow them to participate in a career and technical education program. During that process, I had the opportunity to tour a residential building program taking place in Ann Arbor. The Ann Arbor Student Building Industry Program has been in existence for 45 years. It's a public-private partnership. It provides high school students with a unique learning experience. Through the actual construction of a new home from the raw land to finished product, students learn the importance of math skills, architectural dimension, job satisfaction, along with teamwork, responsibility, and dependability. The program began as a dream of representatives of the school system, local businesses, banking representatives, and members from our association. John Burko, AKA coach to the students, says they, the students, are the product the house is the tool. Students who complete this program will have acquired the 60 hours of pre-licensure time required before you can take the builder's license exam. At the bill signing amending the Michigan Merit Curriculum, I mentioned to our president at the time that our work is just beginning, which is why I'm here tonight. And what I meant by that is while it's great the legislation was signed into law, as an association, we need to create the awareness campaign for students so that they will take career technical education program in residential building. It is up upon us to create the demand for the programs. NPR recently did a story entitled, Economists Say Millennials Should Consider Careers and Trades. There are good paying jobs opening up in the trades and some pay better than what a college graduate makes. As we see the immediate need today, the problem is only going to increase in the, as the size of baby boomers retire from the industry, creating additional need in the skilled trades area. So we're creating an awareness campaign that has a student guidebook that shows students what opportunities are in residential building. And for example, someone who has an interest in becoming a carpet installer needs a high school diploma or an equivalent, and they can, take any, they can make anywhere from $12.47 an hour to $31.92 per hour. They will have some apprenticeship training, and the forecast of employ, employment growth in Michigan through 2020 is at 8.9%, and the list goes on. So I'm here tonight to commend you for opening up enrolling and allowing more students in, but also to offer the opportunity to partner with you on how we create that awareness program so that students understand there are all opportunities available for them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Do this without dropping. Good evening. Rob, you want to introduce yourself? Oh, good evening. Yeah, my name is Rob Wright. Uh, I'm the owner of Wright Builders. <clears throat> I'm here representing the Home Builders Association of Midland tonight, uh, and also as a citizen. Um, I'd like to thank you for your hard work. I know that uh, sometimes being a board member is a pretty thankless job. I was pretty ecstatic uh, this morning when I got the email from uh, Mr. Sharrow that the class would not be canceled. Uh, that was the original reason for us to be here, was to plead for it not to be dropped. Um, uh, as Mr. Wasman knows, uh, I was a member of the Midland Public Schools uh, CTE committee a number of years ago that analyzed, you know, what were the issues. We've been, we've been tracking this problem for a long time. Um, there's been a building commitment uh, stated, but never really a full-fledged, let's get behind it, like we've seen from the governor uh, right on down through now, I, I believe the Midland Public Schools. Uh, the issue is, how do we do that? What are, what are the ways to do that? Um, I'm going to focus on one thing. Uh, Mr. Sherrill said uh, we need to find solutions. And uh, while there's a lot of different points to talk about, I think one of the critical ones is uh, the middle school level. Uh, when you look at the middle school level uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, there was a lot more uh, what I call hands-on, uh, or as uh, Mr. Delinsky uh, stated, uh, teach, teach a man to fish, teach a person to fish type classes. And uh, I've seen those diminished on my time on that CTE committee. 
uh, we took a tour of the schools. We actually went to Jefferson Intermediate. Um, I, yeah, it was uh, middle school at that point. And um, they took me into one of the uh, hands-on classrooms, and I said, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. What's this class? And they said, well, this class is World of Technology, which has a little bit of a, a, little bit of a scary name. I haven't met the new uh, director of curriculum yet, but uh, it was uh, Ms. Ellison at the time. And uh, I said, this is a great class. This, uh, they take this at sixth grade? No, they can't take this till seventh grade. And then I asked her, well, what's the class that they take next? And she said, we don't have a next class. OK, so we really need, in my opinion, we really need to look at the middle school if we want to uh, raise awareness. We need to get some more classes so that a, a, a child, uh, male or female, uh, has that next step. They've, they've got to have that step once they get excited about using their hands uh, to go to the next level. Um, and we don't have that currently. The world of technology class, is a, it's, it's marked 7, 8, which means you take it in 7, but then there's no next progression. I think uh, I've heard there's some book, What's Next, from the public schools. I, I, I wanted to look at that, and I couldn't, I couldn't find it online. Um, as Ms. Crandall stated, um, I look around myself in my industry, and um, I'm the young guy. And that's scary, because I'm not young. Uh, people are retiring and leaving, and um, we have nowhere to turn for the people that are going to fix your houses. Nowhere to turn for the people that really know how to deal with these new complex structures. They're not simple houses anymore. Uh, building science is evolving rapidly, and the, the children that are not taking those classes today uh, will not be there to fix those things in the future. And uh, we, we need to get, get focused on it. And so I think the middle school level uh, is, a, is a great place to show that commitment. And so uh, again, if there's any questions anybody had for me, I'd, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions? No, I think we look forward to working with you guys yeah. on and this going you. forward. We're going to be bunch. calling on you. And us you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Jody Sass, and I'm the Executive Officer of the Home Builders Association of Midland. I want to thank Superintendent Sharo and the entire board for this opportunity to speak tonight relative to the Midland Public Schools Skill Trades programs in collaboration with the Home Builders Association of Midland. This is an exciting day for the residential industry within our community. About a week ago, I, call, I received a call from Mr. Sharo sharing his view of the importance of building trades in the public school system. We discussed the importance of a collaborative awareness campaign in our community and how we both look forward to working on this grassroots campaign. I am happy, as I'm sure he is too, that our collaborative efforts will now move forward in conjunction with the building trades class being reinstated. As part of its three to five year strategic plan, the Home Builders Association of Midland is beginning a concerted team effort focusing on a partnership with the public schools trades programs, following as just one example, organizing a student chapter. There are currently more than 140 Home Builder Association sponsored student chapters across the country. Student chapters offer opportunities such as mentoring with current members, attending membership and board meetings, as well as countless other areas of opportunities, but most importantly, an introduction to both young men and young women to home building as a rewarding career. As you know, for several years, the Home Builders Association of Midland has partnered with both the Midland Public and Bullet Creek Building Trades programs by offering entries in the Home and Garden Show and the Parade of Home events at no charge. This is important to the HBA as a way to assist with community awareness for the students and our future generation. I'm happy to report that when touring the homes in the spring parade event that ended yesterday, I was informed that the Midland Public Schools Trades House on Collins Street has a very interested couple looking at purchasing the home after viewing it via the parade. This is a great story of win-win relationship that we have. I want to thank the following in support of the program by letters they submitted. Mayor Donker, on behalf of the Reese Endeavor, Mark Dickerson, parent of a child with a significant physical disability whom the class of 2009-10 built a new home for. Jennifer Gentile, a disabled woman who moved from a nursing home to a new home 
constructed in 2011 by the trade students, as well as, as Dawn, uh, Sharon Emery from the Lansing PR firm that assisted, and, and Rob, and all of the caring, su um, supportive community members. I'd like to conclude by saying I'm extremely grateful to the Midland Public School Administration for reinstating the program. This is a great day for the Building Trades students, the HBA, our community, and especially for Ashley Hogan, who's the young disabled woman uh, that whom Bill Brown of the City of Midland, working in conjunction with the MPS Trades Program, was able to call today to let her know that her dream of home ownership is going to become a reality. Um, quoting Mr. Dickerson, not every student is going to excel in the traditional classroom, yet a program like Building Trades gives those students an opportunity. It connects them with real life and an opportunity to see what it takes to make a living as they rub shoulders with professionals who work in our community. It teaches them much more than just how to drive a nail. And the students shared with me that Building Trades is teaching them leadership, teamwork, time management, and empowering them for the future. So thank you very much. Any others? Just a quick comment, Ms. S. Um, just to be abundantly clear on language, reinstated sounds like it was canceled. It was never canceled, it was just a lack of kids. Uh, we're not reinstating anything, we're just getting more kids to come in, which is what, what we need to do. And the future endeavors together to raise awareness, as Rob was saying, will keep us out of that situation where we don't have anything. Class was never canceled per se, it just didn't have enough kids in it. So hopefully we can avert that. Uh, this is, Mike said it right, it's all part of the whole STEM thing. That's a buzzword now maybe, but it's a real effort. How do we get kids interested in, people think of science and engineering as science and engineering, but it's also these other skills that take science and engineering. Um, you know, I'm an engineer and for me to lay out a step, uh, <laughs> Rob knows me well enough, he's laughing at me. Uh, it's a challenge, and uh, having kids that can do that is, is really, really important. So we look forward to doing that. The exciting thing is that the introductory classes are full so that the pipeline yep. will come on exactly. the 2016-2017 year, and we are just glad that this window could stay exactly. open. Exactly. Right. Or it will be open back up, so thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? See none, we'll move on to curriculum and assessment to Brian. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I missed that. <coughs> we met on Monday, April 27th at Carpenter Elementary, and we started out discussing the federal programs. Brian gave the committee an overview of the Title 1A, 2A, and ID funding. Title 1A funding supports building level instruction at Carpenter East Lawn and Plymouth Elementary. The principals of all three elementary schools joined the committee and discussed their use of the funds for the 14-15 school year. Some of the major building initiatives include the support of the community schools model, summer school paraprofessional support, family interventionists, and iPad software for mathematics interventions. Title 2A funds are allocated for professional development initiatives throughout the district. Major activities supported with the 1415 allocation include IBPYP training, MACUL, conferences for teacher leaders, and blended online learning training. Title 1D funds support the Juvenile Care Center and are allocated to counseling services and the digital curriculum software. The committee was also informed that MPS was selected for a federal programs audit in 1516 the district has opted in to an alternate review process that aims to pro avoid major findings by vetting materials prior to the on-site visit. Work has already begun with the MPS federal programs team and state consultants. And um, today was our, our May meeting and we actually met at the juvenile center and um, that, was, that information will come for, at a later meeting. Any questions or comments, Celine? See none now to Brian. Okay. Um, this evening we bring to you for number 5.2 one text for the 28 day review period, and that text will be used for three classes Algebra Point 2, Integrated Math 1, and Integrated Math 2. Uh, the title is Glencoe Algebra 1, published by McGraw Hill, and we will have that book available in the curriculum office for review during that 28 day period. Thank you. Any questions of Brian? See none, we'll move on to finance. We have a study committee minutes from that one. Okay. 
On May 11th, the uh, FFO met. Members present, uh, present were myself, Lynn Baker, Patrick Brzee, uh, Mr. Sharo, and Mr. Cooper, and Carol Lux. We had a guest present uh, presenter, Mr. Keith Pretty and Mr. David Marsh from Northwood University, as well as Daryl Dumbrow from Barton Mallow. March financials, Mrs. Lux presented the March financial reports. No unusual items were, were noted. Northwood University and MPS, Dr. Keith Pretty and Dr. Dave, or, and Mr. David Marsh initiated a discussion with the FFO committee regarding possible cooperation and partnership between Northwood University and the Midland Public Schools. The shared properties between Northwood's campus and H.H. Dow High School and the extension of Sugnut Drive from Maine to Dublin being a primary focus. Bond update, Daryl Dumbrow from Barton Mallow, the construction manager, updated the committee on the current bond work the status of the boiler replacements at the two middle schools, the boiler ins installation work, the asbestos abatement process and how it works, and the beginning design work for the elementary building on the central campus were discussed. Summer tax resolution. Mr. Cooper reviewed the need for summer tax resolution at either the May 18th or June 8th Board of Education meeting. The addition of the board debit tax rate will be new to the resolution. The details are being worked on through the district's bond council and bond financial advisor. Midland County ESA 2015-16 budget. Mrs. Lux and Mr. Cooper reviewed the ESA budget and the underlying budget assumptions as presented by the ESA at an early countywide financial directors meeting. As the individual districts in the county have experienced budget pressure, so has ESA. The ESA budget shows no increase in state aid revenue, an increase in health insurance, and budget reductions through staff reductions, concessions, and budget line item reductions. The FFO committee recommends approval of the MCESA budget, which is brought to the full board today. The next meeting will be June 8th. Any questions? See none, I'll hand it over to Bob. Okay, we have um, <coughs> first, uh, item 6.2. Uh, this is for information only, but we have gifts totaling $19,678.14. They are a wide range from some field trips uh, sponsored by the Friends of the Bay City Recreation Area and also uh, the Midland Kiwanis Foundation. And you'll also see one in there where Northwood was uh, working with our DECA students at state competition to provide some meal money for us. And then you'll see pretty active our Jefferson Parent Advisory Council uh, for both their school party carnival and also for some science materials. And then also the Jefferson Music Parent Association for some musical instruments and uh, lockers. Um, also still just for information from the Midland Area Community Foundation, um, there was some from the East Lawn uh, elementary Student uh, uh, Education Endowment Fund for some work with the Butterflies and Girl Frog Kits. Um, then through the Dow Chemical Community Gifts Fund, and you've seen a lot of those throughout the course of the year for $1,000, which different groups uh, take part in. You'll see the volleyball program for Jefferson Track and Field. And, and then we have a couple of, um, of our uh, endowment or scholarships that come out, and you'll see one for $1,000 there, and also a couple of uh, Pay to play scholarships at both high schools. Um, the last thing under just informational is the Athletic Booster Club at Dow High, and they uh, gave the amount of uh, 4900 for different uh, sports activity funds there. For action uh, under um, uh, 6.3, we have some more gifts. These are gifts that total $93,585.37. One of those gifts is the second year for $75,000 from the Dow Chemical Company Foundation. It's the second half, if you remember, they, they uh, granted us when we started the IBPYP program, $150,000, and they split it into two, so you'll see that. Um, Chestnut Hills PTO um, has put some money towards a computer and classroom magazine subscriptions, and we also had a uh, teacher apply at Jefferson for through Lowe's. Um, for an outdoor science learning lab, and that just got approved. So 
because of the amounts of money involved in those, that requires board action and approval on those. So I'll accept a motion for 6-3, and should I jump to 6-4 also? 6-4, um, so you're approving uh, actually a purchase for that, so it just okay. depends if you want to keep them separate. I'll, I'll wait. Let's do 6-3 first. So we can do it all as one thing. I'll, I'll move six, to approve 6-3. Okay, so we got a motion for 6-3. Do I have support for 6-3? Support. Got a motion to support. Um, any questions on 6-3, the gift's acceptance? A huge thank you. Uh, yeah, Just other what than a gift. <laughs> PYP is so important, and to have that uh, support, and then um, with with the computers and, and the outdoor learning <coughs> center, and it's wonderful. I, I am just so impressed with Chestnut Hill PTO. $18,000. $18,000. So, again, thank you. Any others? Uh, all in favor of 6 3, say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> the ayes have it, and thank you. Okay, and 6 4 is kind of a follow up to other uh, board meetings have been at lately, but the uniform purchases, in this case for Midland High Music uniform purchases. And again, uh, because of the amount of money, we need to have the board approve that. You'll see that. Um, like you've seen in a few of these, the vendors are being chosen because of lots of factors, but you got to remember as they do this a little bit piecemeal at a time, you, you want to be able to match. And mm -hmm. so that comes up pretty frequently. How, how many they can get, what sizes they can get, and then can they match what they already have? So you need to approve this. This is for a purchase order in the amount of $7,997.61. I'll accept a motion. Let's I move to approve item 6.4. Support. Moved by Pam, support by Lynn. Any questions or comments? It's always great to see the band looking sharp. <laughs> uh. <laughs> nice little tagline. There you go. <laughs> Think somebody to adopt that. There you go. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. We'll move on to HR, and we do not have a committee report, I don't believe. That is correct, because we have not had a meeting recently. <laughs> We do have one uh, memorial, however. The board and staff extend their deepest sympathy to the family of David Ackerman, who passed away April 18th. He was an industrial arts teacher at Northeast, Central, Midland High, and Dow High for a total of 29 years with Midland Public Schools, retiring in 1995. Condolences to the family. Um, you see the list of communications to and from the board and our scheduled meetings going forward. Um, and it's time for study discussion. Um, I'll start to my right with Angela. All right, sorry I was late tonight, but I don't know if you said, I was at the Midland Dow girls soccer match. And as these things often happen, it ended in a 1-1 one, one <laughs> tie. Wow. So obviously wow. I could not leave. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I um, went on Saturday night to say, bring it on, Dallas High's musical. It was outstanding, and I guess they had had a lot of technical difficulties during the day on um, Saturday. Their whole light board went out, and if they had not said that at the beginning, I would have never known. I mean, I could not tell that they were dealing with technical issues. They, they just did an outstanding job. So. Um, Thanks to the kids tonight who came and um, displayed their science fair. That was very interesting to um, see what they did. They were all very well spoken when we got to speak to them. Um, really had a good understanding of what they did. So that's exciting to see that. That's it. Um, congratulations to our Gerstacker recipients. Yeah. Um, I was able to attend the ceremony this year and it was wonderful. Angela, you did a great job. Oh, thank you. Um, the, the, this was a great representation of the science fair. I was able to go to the science fair because my son participated in it and those kids are just brilliant with their projects and their presentations and they're so, these, these small little people are, are so articulate in, in coming up and, in, and describing the process of how they've reached the, their conclusions and their projects. Um, it was really just very impressive, and the, the amount of judges was just mind-blowing. I mean, all these volunteers from everywhere uh, just pack that gym elbow to elbow with people, and, and you can walk around and hear all the conversations of these, these kids being interviewed, and it just really was inspiring to see. Uh, my son is very much looking forward to the project again next year, and um, so we'll see where that goes. Um, it was a great uh, thing to recognize Dick tonight. Um, somebody who's, who is too humble to admit how much he, he really does for this community. Um, and you can tell that just by his remarks of, of giving credit to everybody else 
accept himself. So it was great to, to recognize him and, and give him the spotlight that he uh, so very much deserves. Um, other than that, that's, that's really all, all I've got tonight. So overall, good meeting. Lynn. Was. Well, I was at the musical also on Saturday night, and congratulations. I didn't see you. It was on the other side. <laughs> um, it was packed. They even used the upstairs. And uh, it was very fun, and just so many people involved. And uh, as always, it's, it's just a very uh, wonderful night. So congratulations to everybody involved with that. Um, the, the kids tonight with the science fair, and I think we've mentioned that a couple times tonight, uh, whether it was the, with the builders or the teachers and staff. You know, when you hook them young, they get they are so excited. You know, they they get interested so quickly in, in different areas and just to expose them. And uh, I marvel at the projects that they do. Those were things that we did in middle school and high school. So um, great job, Gerstackers. I'm echoing Scott. That was wonderful, and I, I think. It's a night, a day that we can, or an afternoon where we recognize through this ceremony um, our terrific educators, and, and it shows why we can, our kids are exposed to so many of these great opportunities. And they too, very humble. I think every one of them um, expressed the fact that they wouldn't be there without their colleagues and Midland Public Schools and so many people that support them, parents, great students. So. Congratulations, well-deserved awards. The, the logo, um, wow, we, several of us sat at Dow High a few months ago and, and we saw, what, 20 some presentations. These kids put hours and hours into this and just amazing. They, they were fantastic in the thought process. So pretty exciting for Brandy to have her logo selected and it'll be fun to see what we see it on and where it goes. Um, and I was looking at the calendar and I thought, Wow, it's almost the end of the year by the time we have another board meeting. Mm -hmm. We will have gone through graduation and kids through exams, so I hope these next few weeks go very well for everyone. Very good. <clears throat> Last week, Lynn and I and Mr. Sherrill went to the edX uh, celebration, and uh, we went along with Pam Castle and Missy DeBoer, and she won uh, the edX <coughs> award for her marketing class interview day, and I had heard how wonderful that day was um, through Facebook, many comments, so uh, it was really neat to celebrate that day with her, and as well as uh, see all the great um, projects and project-based learning type activities that are happening around Michigan. Um, uh, just a reminder for parents and students that start thinking about summer camps and looking at our website and uh, taking up opportunities for those summer camps. A lot of the same stuff I already mentioned here. I went to, to the performance Friday night with my two daughters, mm -hmm. and you always know it's good when you're four, you'll ask if she can dance in the aisle with the other girls <laughs> as it's going on. And uh, wonderful, wonderful performance. Uh, a lot of big stuff tonight, the new, the new logo, uh, bond ratification, that's a big deal. I'm uh, moving forward here with the schools and work we're going to be doing. There's some long-term changes <coughs> addressed tonight. That's, that's good for the schools. I went to the open house Saturday for the uh, Building Trades House, and it hit me next to that house, <laughs> next to the Building Trades House was a Habitat Humanity House, brand new home. I don't think it's lived there or sold yet. And how cool to see affordable family housing in an area that somebody will be our proposed STEM school just around the block. And to see that part of the city come back and develop, it's, it's a, cool, a cool thing to see. Um, lots of good comments. I just want to apologize to our students and staff. This is the first year in what, 12 years of board service that I've missed the Gerstacker and will be missing IB graduation. Uh, that pains me. I highly encourage anybody to go to IB graduation if they can. Um, when you see the projects that these kids have done, it'll truly wow you. It's the, the, the top end of what we saw today. It's a culmination of what we saw today at a, at a high school level. And I'd just like to comment a little on STEM and our skilled trades, et cetera. You know, I've, I've repeated this a number of times. I serve on Case West Reserve University School of Engineering Visiting Committee, which is an advisory committee of industry, academics, the dean of Michigan's Law of Engineering Schools on it, et cetera. It is abundantly clear that the number one, there are two fundamental issues on STEM that sometimes don't get talked about. One gets talked about. One is sparking interest. How do you spark an interest? 
and that's what we talked about tonight. And that interest is in anything related. It's in rudimentary math skills. How do I take satisfaction out of a skill in a simple math problem? Not to be a complex math problem. How do I do computing to figure out how to do a stair? How do I do all these kind of things from fundamental to, to broad? And how do we spark that interest? But the one thing that isn't talked about is it's hard. There's a reason kids don't go into it. it if you don't have an interest at all, it's hard. It's difficult. It takes discipline. It takes hard study. Uh, from I don't care if it's basic or complicated. It's difficult. The only way to get through the difficulty is with generating an interest that someone wants to exercise hard. It's no different than lifting weights. It's no different than running. It's the same thing. If you're interested and you have someone to tell you how to do it and teach you how to do it, you will do well. We can provide the people who can teach you how to do it well. We do that already. Now the next evolution is how do we create the spark? And so I'm looking forward to as we go into this with our community partners, our elementary school, the home builders, here's our chance to do the spark. The spark was lit uh, back, in the day, back in the day for many of my age by the space program. It was a wow thing. Um, how do we create a wow? There's not a space program to do that, but how do we locally create a wow so the kids want to go do that hard work? Anyway, that's my only comment of, of how do we generate interest. Mike. Several items tonight. Um, one, uh, I wrote to you about the teacher evaluation tool, and um, you know there's been um, forward leaps and backwards leaps by our legislators and change direction, and um, we've been kind of sitting in the back waiting for a while, and it's time to move forward for ourselves one way or another where the uh, legislators are going. We know enough about where they're going to go anyway to, to, to do that. Um, one of the leading evaluation tools out there for teachers is something called 5D Plus. And so uh, we've had Brian make contact um, with that organization and we're going to move forward. We're going to begin to train our administrators um, this August in the 5D process and the administrators to come back and train the teachers. And I think that both administrators and teachers are excited about that opportunity um, and going forward. Along with that is also the evaluation tool for the administrators, one that's called School Advance. And just and the reason I bring this one to you is at some point it's also one that you will have to begin to use to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so um, we're going to have to eventually get you some trainings, or, or one or two of you training will come back and train the others, one of the uh, one one of the others. So, um, but um, still a lot going on with the evaluation tool. But we're going to move forward. What it's weighted and what criteria you're going to use will all be figured out. So I hope hopefully soon by the legislators as we go forward. Um, our, many of you know that we provide auxiliary services to our parochial schools and um, in studying some issues that we in our budget and studying our budget um, we've discovered some issues with our parochial schools where um, we probably weren't breaking even like we thought we had at, at there so we began to study that a little closer and we are servicing their kindergarten students presently and we cannot claim FTE with the state of Michigan for that and so that's maybe one of the reasons uh, we were at least breaking even and so um, at this point we've made a decision we'll provide auxiliary services but not to the K students which then downsizes the number of teachers we need will break us even in providing those services which is all we really care to do from there. Um, some of the parochials have expressed interest in purchasing those services. I think we're going to do a little more study on that because they have to have a certain amount of students in order to break even. If that causes us hiring a new teacher it's really not impossible to, to break even on that so there's a little bit of work maybe to do if that's but I wanted you to know that just in case you hear from some of the parochial schools they got it they were good about it um, my understanding is and so we're moving forward as you know we've um, hired a couple or moved a couple principals recently and with Janet's moving um, we have moved just Jaster to the Midland High School principal so congratulations to Jeff and with that movement um, uh, we had to fill the North East principal's job and that is going uh, to go to Dirk DeBoyer. And so congratulations to Dirk on that, which then leaves, um, if you recall, our budget originally had some reduction in administration, still does reduction in a number of administrators, but that original reduction before Janet left um, had um, a, a couple of our employees, um, one completely without an assignment in, in administration, the other one a part, partial assignment in administration reduced. And so this will allow both of them um, somewhat return one full and one to the reduced position as we go forward. So that was a good as well. Um, 
we've been working with our employee groups. Um, we have quite a few contracts up, and so the HR division is quite busy. Uh, one of the ones that we've wor worked with first was our administrative group, and um, they have um, agreed to some concessions as we go forward. So we're very excited about that group. Um, and it, it got the dollar savings that we were trying to get with our teachers group. The percentage-wise, the administrators were able to meet that. Um, they were they did not have to take a direct deduct from their pay. They are paying a little more for their health care and they're reducing longevity and some other pieces in there as well. Some changes to their health care model as well, and that, that reached the savings that we were trying to get. So we're very appreciative for our administrative group coming to that concession as well. We have a. Um, tentative agreement with our Parapro. Once that is ratified by the group, we'll be able to bring that forward to you um, going forward as well. But we have to wait till that vote occurs. The facility, uh, we're called Facilities Finance and Design um, Committee. We've been meeting um, every two weeks with our, our construction manager, our architect, um, technology personnel in there as we go forward. Um, and, and we've spent quite a bit of time so far on that STEM elementary, taking a look at that piece of it. So you know what the summer projects are. It's the boiler mm -hmm. purchases. It's some technology into the middle. But what's coming next is, is that whole STEM elementary, the auditorium over at Central. And so um, at this point, um, our architect has found two uh, schools that have been designed from the ground up that service mm -hmm. elementary students. There's not many out there. There's some that have been redesigned, take a present building, redesign it, but um, two from the, from the ground up. And so um, we're looking to be able to go out and visit those two schools. We've had some discussion with some of our corporate sponsors to maybe send us there, because we don't like to use public dollars for that. And so hopefully that can occur, and we can go take a look at those. Um, this week we met, met and presented, uh, Brian presented for us and did a great job. Um, our, our concept of what the STEM elementary will look like, what the curriculum will look like, and a broad brush. Um, and um, we're trying to do that. We met with Dow first. We're going to probably move on to Dow Corning and our foundations and begin to get that thought out there and looking for um, potentially some sponsorship there as well. I think the discussion went well. It's too early to know exactly what that means, um, but we'll continue moving forward. So we had that discussion as well today. Um, the Northwood piece that you heard in the um, FFO minutes um, would like to address that. I, I've actually, um, probably a year ago, um, Dr. Pretty called me and we had a meeting and he explained um, this uh, road extension through the back. It's going to divide a little bit of our campus. And one of the concerns he has back there as well is um, what might we get on both sides of the road that ends up right on our campuses for businesses. To be honest, there are certain businesses that fit by a school, certain businesses that do not. Um, and so also, Northwood is going through, um, I think, a 10-year study of um, what they want their campus to look like. And they are going to look at building student apartments. And they would like to build that um, towards the Dow side high, uh, Dow side back of our property there. And uh, they are interested in the property that would get divided by that road. And it's about a 10 to 12 acre plot. Um, that interest could be trade-off for services, it could be dollars, all that. He's, we've left it very open at this point in time. So I think the next step is go out and identify that piece of property. Where is it exactly? What does it look like? Uh, maybe take a few of the board members to there, take a look at that, probably estimate the cost, and then continue our discussions on what that might be. Um, it's a property that looks like, according to everything I've heard so far, is property we don't use probably will never use isn't that close to our present facilities work. But we want to go out and take a look at that. That's going to be student apartments um, backing up to the back of Dow High as well. So there's woods in between. Um, <laughs> you know what happens in Dow High. So, but anyway, the discussion of good partnership. We need, we, there are some things that they could provide to us as well. We often have facility issues um, where we could use their space from um, soccer fields to um, basketball practice to indoor practices, um, different parts of facilities where we could share with each other as well. And he's looking forward for all, to all that, to continue that partnership. He realizes Northwood's right there with Dow High and we should be cooperating more is, is one of the things he would like to talk about. So that's been our discussion so far on that. 
And, and again, I want to mention Dick because I think uh, when you guys were interviewing me, one of the first people I met when I was interviewing very nervously was probably standing up there like I was tonight presenting to him was Dick who came up and talked to me prior. And um, if you know, my wife's got quite a passion for early childhood education. And, and um, that was one of the things Dick and I spoke about when we first met. And uh, I've been impressed with him every moment. And, I, and like I called Jerry when I saw the war and I said, this, this is the perfect example. I mean, he, he's not just a regional champion for children. He should be the state champion for, for children. And so um, a well-deserved award to Dick. And as, as Scott said, he's so humble when he took the award, too. So and that's all I have for you. Any other questions for the good of the order? Seeing none, we are adjourned. <laughs>